Thursday, September 19th, the news of Europe. At this time and each evening at 6.45 Eastern Daylight Time, Columbia calls in its correspondents abroad for the latest reports on the economic, diplomatic, and battle fronts. Today we are to hear from Eric Severide in London, Edwin Hartrich in Berlin, and Cecil Brown in Rome. But while we're waiting to hear from Mr. Severide by transatlantic shortwave radio, here's the situation at home. The government has mailed registration forms to the adjutant generals of 48 states. In turn, the states will print the blanks, which 16 and a half million men will fill out on October 16th, the day men register for military training. And speaking of conscription, the president is expected to appoint a director of selective service today or tomorrow. After that happens, draft organization is expected to move at a rapid pace. Elsewhere in the nation's capital, the Senate continues debate on the excess profits tax plant amortization bill today, and leaders hope for passage of the measure tonight. The House convenes after a two-day recess, but there's not much on the calendar. The representatives will get around to picking up a majority leader to Sam Rabin of Texas, who has become speaker, succeeding the late William B. Bankhead. On the political side of the news, Wendell Wilkie is in California today. He'll make a major speech in Los Angeles tonight concerning domestic issues. And now, for the report of Eric Saravaride, we take you to the British capital. Go ahead, London. Good morning, this is London. We've had one short alarm so far this morning after the usual night-long plastering over most of London last night. One bomber today dropped a few near the city, and another was shot down in the sea. The Air Ministry says the enemy last night scattered high explosive bombs blindly on the capital from aircraft which approached singly or in small formations. They say that all the fires caused last night by incendiary bombs are under control this morning. Casualties were heavy last night. The total figure is not yet in, but we're informed that at least 90 people have been killed and around 350 seriously injured. Among the places hit were a big hotel, a public hall, and a big popular department store. The sidewalks along Oxford Street, the principal shopping avenue, were littered all yesterday with broken glass. Just a stick full of bombs have knocked out four big stores there now, and that means that virtually overnight thousands of people have lost their jobs. As usual, the RAF bombers worked all night long in the so-called invasion ports of Boulogne, Calais, Dunkirk, and Ostend. And reporters down at Dover said they could see a big fire at Boulogne and a constant series of bomb flashes from heavy explosives all through the night. I saw some freakish results of bombing around my place this morning. Down the street, there was a clean hole in the pavement, about two feet wide. A small bomb had gone in and exploded well underground, and the pavement had just swelled upward in a big hump without breaking. It's astonishing how hard it is to tell where a bomb has landed or how big it is when you hear it or feel it. No two persons in the same room ever agree. One night there was a crash of glass. I thought it was a small bomb just outside. Another man thought it was an unexploded bomb which had hit the building. A third, who's made a point of watching the bombing each night, swore it was a big one three blocks away. Actually, it was a bomb which had hit the building and exploded. Last night, my building shook violently. I was sure an unexploded bomb had landed just outside in the street. Well, this morning after breakfast, I walked around the neighborhood. A half block away, I came across the first smashed storefronts. They got worse as I followed the street. I went four full blocks before I found the craters, two of them caused by bombs of terrific force. They had landed near an intersection. Some unused trolley tracks were twisted around like wire. Nearby, a furniture factory was still smoldering from last night's fire. It would take me about 10 minutes to list the damage to stores and flats just around those two craters, although no building had collapsed. But let me tell you what I saw in that four-block stroll. Glass had been smashed in an institute for the blind, a tea shop, a tobacco shop, a medical supply store, three pubs, a Lions restaurant, a subway station, two vacant houses, three automobile markets, a fruit shop, a hotel, a chemist's shop, two barber shops, a dress shop, a funeral parlor, a garage, a hardware store, and several apartment houses. And that was just along one street. Neither of the two bombs had actually hit that street. So the damage to the streets parallel, I assume, must have been comparable. I couldn't find any other craters around, so I'm sure it all resulted from those two explosions. 
Traffic is temporarily snarled, of course, and one subway station had to close down. And that seemed to be about the extent of the vital damage and the only gain to the Germans in that area. In the opposite direction from my place, a big bomb hit a steel and concrete building. It went right through it and killed a number of people in the basement shelter. We're informed that at least two of the raiders last night were brought down by anti-aircraft fire. That would make the official total for the week about 252 German planes for 38 British. The directors of the Bank of England were obliged to hold their general meeting down in the vaults of the bank, but they felt better when they left because they had just declared a 6% dividend minus the income tax. I return you now to CBS New York. Here in New York, a bulletin from Mexico City. The newspaper El Universal said today that all outlying garrison commanders had been ordered to report to the state of Chihuahua where a rumor circulated that one Villalba had led a revolt. This could not be confirmed. We take you now to Berlin for the report of Edwin Hartridge. Go ahead, Berlin. <clears throat> this is Berlin. This morning there seems to be little concrete news regarding military operations. So far we learn that new flights of German armed reconnaissance planes are now over England. But we have little news of bombing so far today. According to reports here, for two days now, there have been armed reconnaissance flights over England, and whether this press edge is <clears throat> a lull or a let-up, we can't say for sure. And here's the official news of British operations over Germany last night. According to the DN Bay, the German enemy planes were forced to turn back and so dropped their bombs on non-military objectives. Nine British planes were shot down by anti-aircraft batteries and two more by fighter planes. The official, official news agency states that the British dropped their bombs on the Bodelschwing Asylum at Bethel, where three hospital buildings were hit. Nine children were killed and 12 injured, the report adds. Then we have some additional information from the day in Bay about raids on London yesterday. According to this report, several raids were made on the British capital, which during the day experienced its 100th air raid alarm. According to this report, unfavorable weather did not hinder attacks on the Tilbury docks and on a fuel depot and tanker at the Port Victoria docks. Fifteen British planes were shot down, says this report, while the home team lost only three planes. And then while the storm raged over the channel, a British convoy consisting of ten ships was attacked by the German long-range coastal artillery. This presumably took place off Dover, though the newspapers do not give further details. However, they say that the guns succeeded in hitting several of the ships during the storm, forcing them to return to port. The storms along the channel have ripped 172 barrage balloons from their moorings, we are told here this morning. These balloons drifted over the continent where they were destroyed by the Germans. There is an, amu an amusing and true story that has drifted into town regarding the troubles that Americans had when they were forced to evacuate from Lithuania after the Soviet troops annexed that Baltic country. One day, the American legation in Kaunas received a telephone call that the Russians were taking over the library of films and the office of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. A counsel was sent to the office to investigate. There he found a small man in charge of the premises. Who are you, asked the counsel officer. I am a commissar, the latter replied. And the American consul asked the Russian, by what right are you taking over this office? It is American property. Then the little commissar answered, I don't care. I'm taking over this office and property by virtue of a law, a Russian law. What law, asked the American. And the commissar drew himself up stiffly and replied, by virtue of a law to be passed next Monday. Then as a parting shot to the American consul, the Russian added, you Americans enforce your own laws in your own country, and we Russians will enforce our own laws here. We are still waiting for some concrete news about the results of a visit to Berlin of Serrano Sunye, the Spanish Minister of the Interior, and also about the visit of Herr von Ribbentrop to Rome. German Foreign Affairs Minister is to have a conference with Senior Mussolini this afternoon in Rome. These events have aroused much speculation as to whether a winter campaign against the British in the Mediterranean is now being planned. The two major objectives would be Gibraltar in the west and Suez Canal in the east. And there was one significant sentence in an interview that Senor Sunier gave to the Folkser Beobachter before he arrived in Berlin. The Spaniard said, quote, Spain must also have an empire in Europe. And then in this interview, he added that when a new order emerges in Europe, Spain must regain Gibraltar. 
And along this line, there are unconfirmed reports that the Pétain government may return to Paris from Vichy by agreement with the German military authorities. And according to these same reports, as yet unconfirmed, the line of demarcation between the occupied and unoccupied France would disappear. And the German military authorities could thus move their troops all over France. Well, the emphasis and the speculation here in the past few days has all been to suggest Mediterranean developments on a grand scale. Speaking of bombings in Germany, Dr. Tott, the builder of the Westfall, has ordered that all damage caused by bombs shall be repaired immediately. This is the wish of Herr Hitler, he explained, and for this purpose, building materials may be requisitioned if unobtainable from ordinary sources. This is Edwin Hartrich. I return you now to Columbia in New York. Back in New York, a dispatch from Cairo. The Italian advance into Egypt has reached a standstill at Sidi Barani, and advanced forces were consolidating their positions in and around the town, the British Middle Eastern Command said today. Now we take you to the Italian capital for the report of Cecil Brown. Go ahead, Rome. This is Rome. British naval units in the Mediterranean shelled the Italians advancing by the coast road into Egypt. The Italian High Command announced an hour ago that the fascist troops stretched out along the coast between Bardi and Sidi Barani came under fire from the ships. The communique says fascist planes intervened and bombed the British naval units. It adds that the ships were forced to cease firing and retreat. A 10,000-ton British cruiser, said the bulletin, was hit by a torpedo dropped by one of the Italian planes. We're told the cruiser was severely damaged. The communique says fascist planes have been steadily bombing British columns and mechanized units which are retreating. Fascist planes also were reported to have bombed the defenses of Marsa Matru, the next British stronghold facing the Italian. British planes struck at Italian positions in Libya. Bombs were dropped on Tobruk, Bomba, and Benghazi, causing minor damage. Two British planes were reported brought down by Italian fighter machines. The communique says three more probably were hit. Another was shot down by naval anti-aircraft fire. The British raided Italian positions in the Dodecanese Islands in the eastern Mediterranean. The communique says the islands of Rhodes and Maros were attacked, but the bullet adds the bombing was indiscriminate and most of the bombs fell in the sea. Small fires were started, but no casualties were reported. One British plane was reported shot down by anti-aircraft batteries. In East Africa, the British bombed various objectives in Italian Somaliland, Eritrea, and Ethiopia. Small damage was reported, and we are told there were 20 casualties among the civilians, seven of which were fatal. And fascist planes bombed ships at anchor in Aden. I've just come from the Central Railroad Station, where I've watched German Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop step off his armored train. It came into the station with its two anti-aircraft guns jutting up in the air. Von Ribbentrop stepped off the train and stretched out his hand to Foreign Minister Chano. They smiled broadly. Ribbentrop moved slowly down the platform, shook hands and saluted with each member of the Nazi embassy staff in Rome. That took nearly ten minutes. Then the two Axis ministers went outside the station, posed for the usual pictures, and drove off in the same car. I've watched von Ribbentrop step down from a train in Rome a number of times. For the first time, however, among those greeting him was the Spanish ambassador to Rome. Von Ribbentrop is expected to sit down and talk things over later this afternoon with both Count Chano and Mussolini. The Popolo di Roma says the discussions will concern the new Europe, but there's no doubt they will also concern the present Europe. As we see it here, at this stage in the war, extending from the Thames to the Nile, some of the problems facing the Axis are the progress of the Nazi attack on Britain and Italy's war in Egypt. The visit of Serrano Sr. to Germany has brought up a discussion here about the plans of Spain and the future of Gibraltar. Then there are the frequent press attacks against the B.C. government. These attacks show the Axis powers are dissatisfied with the operations of the French government. This is Cecil Brown in Rome. I return you now to CBS in New York. Once again, Colombia has brought you first-hand reports from its correspondents in the European capitals. This morning, we heard from Eric Severide in London, Edwin Hartridge in Berlin, and Cecil Brown in Rome. George Bryan speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>